Every time you turn around, there's some new AI tool, some new AI breakthrough, and it can get confusing and overwhelming, especially with all this new terminology and concepts. So in this series of videos, I'm going to break down all the important AI terms you need to know in a way that makes sense, starting with what you probably already know and building up from there. So you may know some of this, you may not know all of it, you might also know someone that doesn't know it and may benefit from this video. So the goal of these videos is to fill in the gaps so you'll be able to not only understand and make sense of all the buzz and hype, but to be part of the conversation and actually start doing things with AI. So let's start with the basics. What is AI or artificial intelligence? Even though it might feel like it, AI isn't new. The concept of AI has been around since almost the beginning of computers. Because the moment we created computers, we've dreamed of making them think like us or work for us. So at its core, AI is about creating systems that can perform tasks that typically require human intelligence. And we've been actually using AI in our daily lives without even knowing it. Like the way Netflix or Spotify can predict what to play next, or the predictive text on your phone, or even Google Translate but it goes way further back than that. We've also seen that in pop culture, mainly science fiction, we deal with both the fears and the possibilities of what an AI future can look like. But in any case, we're not at that future yet because right now we're in the era of narrow AI. And this means AI systems that are really good at specific tasks but can't transfer that knowledge to other areas. ChatGPT, for example, is really good at writing, text, or code, but it can't suddenly decide to learn how to ride a bike. It's confined to its specific capabilities. And since I already mentioned ChatGPT, let's talk about it because ChatGPT is what made AI popular. But this is only a single product from one company, OpenAI. So ChatGPT, like it sounds, is a chat bot, which essentially is just a way for us to interact with AI. We use them all the time. It's the main way that we interact with AI right now. The most popular ones today are, of course, ChatGPT, Claude, Gemini, Perplexity, the list goes on. And we'll talk about more of those later. The way we talk to these chatbots are with prompts. And you might call it a message or a question or a query, but essentially when you're talking to it, you are prompting the AI. You put in an input and its response is an output. In the last few years, there's been a very popular concept called prompt engineering. And it's not as intense as it sounds. Basically, prompt engineering is a practice in which you build complex prompts to achieve better outputs. And as AI has gotten better, it becomes less relevant. So while most models are getting so good that you may not even need to learn prompt engineering, I still recommend learning the basics because then you'll understand the limitations and what you can do and get better outputs from AI. What are models? So models are the underlying AI systems. Think of it as the brains. So new models are released all the time. They come in various sizes and are often an improvement on the last one, like GPT-3 went to GPT-4, went to GPT-4.0. O1 is a separate model. Claude, for example, we have Claude Haiku, which is the small model, Claude Sonnet, which is the medium-sized model, and Claude Opus, which is the large model. So again, you can think of models as the brains and the chatbots as their mouths. So let's just continue with ChatGPT. The GPT in ChatGPT stands for Generative Pre-Trained Transformer. Now, what is a transformer, you might ask? So transformers is the major breakthrough that gave birth to the LLMs. They were invented by Google in I think 2016. It's what powers the magic behind all LLMs like ChatGPT, Claude, Perplexity, Llama, etc. Essentially, what it allows AI to do is understand the semantic similarity between words like king and castle. So LLMs stand for large language models and they use transformers and they are trained on huge data sets like think the entire internet. And this is why we can engage in conversations that feel natural and human-like. The way they essentially work is kind of like the auto-predict feature on our phones. So based on the context you feed it, they are able to connect the dots and predict the next word, but the next thousand words, for example, or the next thousand tokens. And because they're pre-trained on so much data, they usually get things right, but they are often known to get things wrong. And when they get things wrong and when they make mistakes or it feels like they're lying, this is known as a hallucination. And one of the most annoying things about hallucinations is that when they happen, they do it so confidently. They're so sure about the wrong information they're giving you. And this happens for various reasons. The most common reasons being they don't have enough context on what you're prompting it on. They weren't trained on that or they're running out of the context window. So what is the context window? So the context window is the AI's short-term memory. It's how much information it can keep in mind at once. And this pretty much happens on a per chat basis. The bigger the context window, the more of your conversation it can remember and the better it performs. Right now, I would say that the common context window size, and this varies between companies and models, is about 128,000 tokens. That being said, Google's models have about a 2 million token context window. Whoa, 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 what are tokens? So tokens 
are how AI sees words. Basically, they don't interpret or understand text the way we do. They break words down into tokens. So in general, a token is about three fourths of a word. And again, this varies between models. Every model breaks down tokens differently. Just to kind of make it make sense, a token could be broken down to multiple things. It could be broken down into a full word. It could be part of a word. It could be a single character, or it could even be a part of punctuation. So knowing that each model is limited by its context window, the longer your conversations get, the smaller your context window becomes. So I strongly advise you to keep your conversation short and to the point and to start new conversations often because then the context window starts over. Now, one word you might hear next to the word LLM a lot is multimodal. And what this means is that it could essentially be interacted with with multiple sources like text, video, sound, pictures. So at first we were only able to interact with them via text like ChatGPT, that's how it started, right? But now we can send them pictures. We can also chat with them with our voice, and the back and forth chat with like advanced voice mode. And that is what multimodal means. And everything we've talked about until now has fallen into the bucket of generative AI, gen AI. And that's essentially what it sounds like. It's where AI can generate things, be it text, audio, images, etc. So some examples of this might be text and code. So like we know, ChatGPT and Claude, image generation like Dolly or Midjourney or Flux. When it comes to video, the big popular one from OpenAI is Sora that came out about a month ago. Music, there's a bunch of them. My favorite one is Suno, which sounds really good, makes great songs just based on text. So in the last part of this video, I'm gonna talk about the major players, the ones I talk about the most, because that could also get quite confusing. So we already talked about ChatGPT, which is a product of OpenAI. Another model that I use and talk about a lot is Claude. It's one of my favorite models. And that's from the company Anthropic. And just so you know, Anthropic was founded by ex OpenAI employees. Anthropic makes a great product. If until now you've only used ChatGPT, I suggest just try out Claude because it's not just a clone of ChatGPT. It's a different product. It feels differently. And I use them both for different things. Of course, we still have companies like Google who invented the transformer is also a major player in the AI space. Their main product right now is Gemini. And one of my favorite products and tools that came out of Gemini is Notebook LM. I did a video on it. I'll link it somewhere. It's very, very cool. Another big company is Meta or Facebook, and they took a whole different approach. They open source it. They released Llama, and this is a open source model. This means unlike the models I just mentioned, is that Llama's code and weights are both open and free for everyone to use, everyone to replicate. There are of course, Tons of other notable competitors and companies like Mistral and DeepSeek and Perplexity. And I'll talk about them in other videos. And essentially, all these companies are all racing towards the same thing. Two main goals of the way I see it. One is to capture market share and get them the most users using their models, using their tools. But two, and more importantly, is the first to achieve AGI or ASI. So until now, we've gone over the basics of narrow AI. But what comes next? And by the way, the terminology and timeline is highly disputed throughout the AI community, but AGI stands for artificial general intelligence. And it's when we leave narrow AI, it's when AI can match human level intelligence in all domains. Like I said, there's a lot of conflicting definitions of what AGI is. I essentially define it when AI can do any task just as well as the average human. But I guess it really depends on your definition. So these companies are racing towards it. And by the way, it's not just the companies that are racing towards it, it are the countries that are racing towards it because essentially we're in an AI arms race. Whichever country is able to achieve AGI first will be at a severe advantage over the rest of the world. You could just imagine what happens when we get there. So. The next stage after AGI comes ASI, and it's not that far behind. People believe it will happen quite fast after reaching AGI. And ASI stands for artificial super intelligence. And essentially that means AI that will surpass human capabilities in every way. We won't be able to understand it. We'll be able to speak in its own language. It'll be able to learn and teach itself and improve itself. And that is the big one. That's where it gets to this science fiction-y future that we see in all these movies. And it doesn't have to be scary, by the way. If we do this right, it doesn't have to be scary. So I think that covers the basics of common AI terminology. In the next videos in the series, I'm gonna delve into more advanced topics and keep building from there. Understanding these terms isn't just about keeping up with the tech talk. It's really about being able to use these powerful tools efficiently, knowing their limitations and being ready for the next major change in our society. So if you found this explanation helpful, like and subscribe. If you know someone that would benefit from this and needs to understand the basics of AI, send them this video. Drop a comment below if there's any terms you'd like me to explain further or something else that I didn't talk about. Thank you for watching and have a great day.